Uh, hey, how are we doing out there, guys? So, uh, welcome back to the Bastion Black Performance Podcast. We're going to talk tonight a little bit about the, the question a lot of people are asking, which is, is the tank dead, or is the armored vehicle dead, or is armored warfare dead, or irreparably damaged, or anything like that? So this is a question, I mean, a lot of people are asking a lot of people about this. So I'm going to kind of weigh in on some things, you know, kind of, you know, my opinion, um, but also kind of dealing with, you know, my strengths, which is more in the the sort of vast historical, you know, general information versus the incredibly hyper-specific um, information. So other people who have done a, a good job with this or whose channels I generally like on YouTube anyway. So you've got like uh, the Chieftain Nicholas Moran for like anything like, you know, armored vehicle specific or like incredibly hyper-specific doctrine. That's a very good channel. Uh, Bernhard, um, guy who runs Military History Visualized, very good, um, very good with like diagrams and and um, and he's someone who, who's a native German speaker. So he, he does a lot of, um, you know, kind of uh, decoding and uh, deciphering uh, German doctrine and things like that from World War II. Um, I like the Military Aviation Channel because aviation is not a super big passion of mine individually. So, um, you know, if I'm kind of diving into very specific um you know, I guess like specifications, some of that, some of those are good. And there's certainly more out there. Those are just the ones that come to mind. So, and I always try to be upfront, like when I speak about things, I don't want to be like, oh, like every single thing is something that I went and personally researched and read the archives and translated and things like that's not how it works. You know, we all, we all read books. We watch, you know, talks of this or that. We form our own opinions. We have our own experiences that we've, you know, we actually done in real life and all sorts of things like that. So, um, to kind of, you know, I guess one to just answer the question in the uh, the beginning of the video, which is no, the tank's not dead, the armored vehicle's not dead, armored doctrine's not dead. Uh, no, none of that's dead. Um, but what we are seeing play out in Ukraine is, I mean, realistically, it's I mean, it's the first major conflict that has pitted modern armor versus modern anti-armor weapons, particularly man portable or crew served, you know, relatively, um, uh, you know, portable anti-tank weapons. We haven't really seen that. So for all the, you know, 20 years in the GWAT that America's done, and, and we did a lot of operations with armored vehicles and tanks, like I personally worked with tanks a lot, like in the Battle of Fallujah and things like that. We weren't facing an enemy that had the actual legit capabilities to knock those out. So, they, you know, you know, the, the RPG-7 and things, RPG-7 is, I mean, it's the single best shoulder fired, you know, rocket that's ever existed. But it is out of its, you know, out of its realm to take on the M1 Abrams. Um, you know, there have been M1 Abrams that have been se severely damaged. Uh, a couple have been knocked out. I don't think there's been any catastrophic kills that I can remember with that. I know there's been uh, Merkava tanks in, in Israel that have been catastrophically destroyed by the, the lowly 50-year-old RPG-7. But, um, to, I mean, to legitimately go up against you know, modern main battle tanks like the M1 Abrams, you have to have something that is of a generation or a couple generations beyond that to uh, to have reasonable, um, you know, chances of success. So this is kind of the first chance that we've gotten to uh, gotten to see some of those things in a long time. And so it's it's playing out kind of interestingly. And so what I think we're seeing on display here is not really so much the failings of armor or it's not even necessarily the pitting of anti-armor weapons against armored vehicles. What you're seeing here is the doctrine, or maybe even more specifically, the application or the lack of application of armored doctrine to um, to the modern battlefield or to a uh, to a modern or a relatively modern um, adversary when it comes to that. So. To, uh, to kind of speak in, again, in general terms here. So when we're talking about armored operations, so again, I'm not going to speak about individual countries' exact doctrine or anything like that. I'm going to kind of speak in, in general terms, so this will, you know, kind of applies to, uh, to everyone a little bit. So the idea of armored operations, you know, when you kind of go back to German, quote-unquote, Blitzkrieg, uh, Bewegungskrieg, uh, Russian deep battle, deep operations, um, you know, Tukhachevsky and Is Isserin's, you know, ideas and things on that. Is, so the, the main idea is that when you're dealing with an enemy, um, at some point, obviously, you have to attack an enemy's front line head on in, in some certain position to force a breakthrough. So the idea is that we used what we call combined arms. So combined arms basically means that we are using at least two different, um, you know, at least two different, you know, 
arms, at least two different ways of attacking an enemy. Um, and the idea being that one sets them up for the other and vice versa. At a very low level, you could think of this like if you're an infantryman and you have an infantry attack coming at you and you start spraying them down with a machine gun, well, what do they do? Well, they all drop to the ground and then they're really hard to hit and you can't hit them anymore. So then what do you do? Well, now you hit them with mortars or you throw grenades at them. So, okay, you start throwing grenades at them. What do they do? They get up and run. Now what do you do? You shoot them with a machine gun. And basically that's, that's the whole idea of combined arms and supporting arms doctrine, which is that you use one weapon to set up the other weapon and vice versa. So the idea being, so one, you should have air assets that are up and they are, one, they're providing you intelligence and, you know, enemy disposition um, in real time or as close to real time as you can get. They are also going to, um, you know, directly attack enemy artillery and things like that because we know artillery causes the majority of the casualties on a modern battlefield. They're also going to be attacking enemy troop movements that are either pulling back or, you know, moving forward. They'll also attack things like bridges and roads and, you know, other things to kind of inhibit the enemy's ability to move. At the same time, friendly artillery is going to begin a preparatory barrage. So one, it's going to probably start on like, you know, enemy, you know, actual fighting positions and things. It's going to hit um, especially enemy heavy weapons, known uh, heavy weapons, known enemy armor or anti-armor emplacements and command and control centers. So the idea being one, to eliminate their most powerful weapons, but also to to attempt to eliminate or severely damage their ability to uh, communicate and control the operations. Um, you know, at the same time, the armored elements are going to punch through the initial part of the front line, and they're going to do this in conjunction with the infantry as well. So the infantry is going to assault uh, the types of terrain that tanks can't get onto, say the high grounds, heights, things like that. Um, the infantry is also going to be out, um, you know, generally cleaning up you know, smaller pockets, um, you know, forward observers, uh, you know, small anti-armor teams are going to be, you know, clearing paths through minefields, uh, doing things like that, while the armor is going to be punching through and then also engaging, um, you know, certain strong points. The idea being that we kind of paralyze the front line, we punch the armor through, and then the armor is going to assault the types of things that matter on like the operational and strategic level. So nobody gives a shit about the hill that you're controlling. I mean, they do. Okay. I'm speaking in kind of, you know, uh, <laughs> I'm just kind of being a dick about it, but so it's not the hill or it's not this particular street or whatever, you know, or this crick bed over here that we care about. We care about the town that has five roads running into it and a railway that runs across the river. We care about the town that has a bunch of roads running into it and then a usable airstrip or helipad or, um, or, you know, some form of, you know, I don't know, like factory or, you know, refinery or, or things like that. That's the stuff that we care about. So we punch through with armored elements. Then we have follow-on elements, which kind of clear out the space that we've already, like, gone through. While the armored elements, you know, kind of stay ahead and, um, you know, and attack these areas, you know, communication centers, uh, logistics centers, major convergences of road and rails and things like that. Because... Then what you see is that now as you start to control these, you know, kind of transit hubs, transportation hubs and stuff, the enemy has a very difficult time moving substantial forces around to be able to properly counter you before your own infantry elements and mop-up elements can kind of clear out more of the battle zone, the battle space, and catch back up with you. So that's kind of the, the basics of what, you know, armored operations are. And then obviously then we kind of just move forward, you know, inch by, you know, incrementally, you know, kind of, you know, phase by phase on that. And so... With that, um, you know, a few vehicles have kind of spawned from that. So obviously we have the main battle tank, which exists, you know, and, and every country kind of has, you know, one. So some, some of the common ones, you know, the T-72, the T-80, the T-90, um, obviously the M1 Abrams. Um, you know, we have the uh, the Challenger, the Leopard 2, the Merkava, all sorts of things. I think France has a Leclerc, but nobody cares about France. Um, so, you know, obviously, you know, we have those. And then lots of infantry fighting vehicles and armored personnel carriers. So I pulled up a couple of them that are just, like, common in the... Uh, the former Soviet sphere. So you have the, the BTR, this is a BTR-80 here, and then the BMP-2. So the general designation is that BTR is a eight-wheeled or a multi-wheeled multi -wheeled vehicle, whereas the BMPs um, and the BDMs are tracked vehicles. So the idea being that the, the tanks are obviously very heavily armored, very heavily armed, and then the armored personnel carriers obviously carry infantry with them, but you know it's now it's kind of advanced to the point where they're also what we call IFVs or infantry fighting vehicles. So this particular one has a, 
I believe the 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 BTR. I think it has a fourteen point five machine gun on top. There's ones that have like, you know, the you know thirty millimeter you know auto cannon. There's there's kind of all sorts of variants and stuff like that. Um, obviously in America we have the the Bradley, so it's got the twenty five millimeter um, twenty five millimeter cannon. Plus it's got you know um, the twin tow launcher on the side, things like that. Um, not really the important thing. So the idea behind the, the infantry fighting vehicles, the armored personnel carriers, is that they provide um, a pretty decent level of protection for the infantry from standard small arms machine gun up to 50 cal, you know, and um, and then other, like, obviously, like, grenades and, you know, fragmentation from mortars and artillery if it's not, you know, really, you know, particularly close proximity. And then, you know, general resistance to things like that. The idea being that they can now maintain the level of speed that the tanks can. But also, in a pinch, now obviously you can use this for fire support, um, you know, if we're attacking a position or if we get assaulted by, you know, an enemy that has other, like, infantry fighting vehicles. They're not meant to stand up and fight with tanks or anything like that. They're meant to be able to provide good, solid fire support, you know, to infantry in their kind of standard role, um, as opposed to just dropping the infantry off and leaving. But they are not meant to fill the role of the tank. So then obviously we have the tank. So what I think a lot of people miss, you know, when it comes to the tank is we get caught up in like tanks killing tanks and things like that. And obviously tanks fighting tanks is, is certainly one of their roles, but still the primary role of the tank. And if you're in America, like the, the only way that we've used the tank basically other than the invasion of Iraq in 2003, a little bit, and then 1991 in Iraq is as an infantry support vehicle. So I, you're firing primarily variants of, high explosive rounds from the main gun, i.e. the types of things that kill infantry, help destroy barriers, help destroy positions and buildings, things like that. And obviously, you know, they have their machine guns and, and stuff like that as well. And so that's still the primary job of the tank is, is to provide that cannon fire, um, you know, close range direct fire support uh, sort of things. Well, it's not even particularly close range. It, it can be, you know, of substantial distance on that stuff as well. And so, you know, kind of, Knowing what those do, you know, also helps us to kind of understand, one, why it is that the, the tank and the armored vehicle are by no means dead. Because if we simply look at roles, there's nothing that can do the role of the tank as well as the tank does the role of the tank. So there's certainly, so we have, for example, you know, in America we have the strikers. And there's certain striker variants that have like the 105 howitzer on top and things like that. Um... Does it have good fire support and general, um, you know, direct fire ability? It does. Does it have good mobility? It does. Does it have good armor protection? It does not. Does it have the ability to go face to face with enemy armor? It does not. Does it have good resistance to, um, you know, indirect fire of more than say 60 millimeter mortar caliber? It does not. Um, you know, so kind of, you know, understanding those things. And then also, you know, conversely, you can talk about like, you know, organic infantry weapons. So we have things like the small rocket, the small D, the Carl Gustav, things like that, um, you know, that provide direct fire ability. So are they hypermobile? Yes. Are they very accurate? Yes. Are they of particularly long range relative to a tank? No, they are not. Are they as mobile as a tank? They are not. Are they, do they have the armored protection? Obviously they do not have any armored protection at all. And same thing, you know, and then you can also get, you know, and we can use this as a judgment against the infantry fighting vehicles as well. You take the Bradley, for example. So the Bradley, it has a, uh, has a 25 millimeter, uh, Bushmaster chain gun. It has a tow launcher that basically holds two tow missiles, you know, at, uh, at a time on the side of it, but it is, uh, so does it have relatively okay firepower in a direct fire role? I would, I mean, compared to a tank, no, it does not. Um, you know, for an infantry support vehicle, it's, it's okay. Does it have the mobility level of a tank? It does. Does it have the armor protection level of a tank? It's aluminum armor, absolutely nowhere. It does not in any way, shape or form provide the level of protection that a tank does. So that's kind of one of the, it's one of the things that we have to think of when it comes to, when we sort of ask ourselves the question of, you know, like why, uh, you know, why hasn't this gone away or why did this go away? Um, you know, and kind of think of it in terms of that, you know, when you go back to, you know, say the horse and horse cavalry, for example. So the horse stayed around for a long time, even within the, you know, the modern realms. So the horse was still used on the Eastern Front by the Soviets um, a fair amount. And so, you know, obviously the Eastern Front tends to occupy a lot of steppe related country that's very open. So you kind of have to ask yourself, you know, is there something else on the battlefield at that time that could exactly fill that role? 
Well, in their army, no, they don't. You know, they didn't have the level of you know the number of jeeps and trucks and things that you know America did, for example. So, very mobile. It still provides the infantry and ability to generally move somewhere, get off their horses, fight, do other stuff, get back on. Okay, cool. They don't really have anything at the time they can replace it. As soon as you know World War II is done, then it's basically done. You look at in America, for example, the horse went away after World War One, and why was that? Well. We have the Jeep. We have other such, you know, similar things. You're like, is the Jeep as mobile as the horse? It is. Uh, can it uh, can it move infantry around and firepower as good as the horse? It can do it better. Um, does it provide some level of protection? Uh, not kind of not really. Is it more versatile? I mean, realistically, probably. You have different variants. Um, you know, you have you have like the ambulance types of jeeps. You have you know scouting jeeps, jeeps with machine guns mounted on the back of them, jeeps with mortars, recoilless rifles, things like that. So so certainly that's why. You know the horse was replaced in that particular, in that particular role. Um, it's also why you saw things like the light tanks. So the beginning of World War II saw a lot of things, especially on the Soviet side. But you know, even if you look at like early war German tanks and stuff. So, you know, the the Panzer One, Panzer Two. Um, no steam. I do not want to do anything with you. Um, you know, so tanks that were by any ladder standards very unarmored and very, uh, you know, outgunned. But at the time, that's what existed. But then obviously. As tanks got better, those vehicles no longer had a role. They were not, you know, they were only as mobile as the latter tanks. Could not match them in armor, could not match them in firepower, and yet they're supposed to serve the same role. So they went away. Same thing, you look at the Russians, you know, they had their various, um, their various light tanks. You know, what is like, you know, the BT-20 or, you know, 28 and, and things like that. Like very quick, very fast tanks, very, like not particularly well, uh, well armed or well armored. But they kind of served a little bit of that, uh. You know, they served the, the armored role and a little bit of that armored assault thing. But as the T-34 came into very, very full production and the, the KV-1 and then, you know, follow on, you know, the, the T-34-85 and, and the uh, the various IS tanks and things. As those came on, served the same role. It's not any more mobile. Definitely not as well armored. Definitely not as good a firepower. You're out. Um, you know, so that's kind of, that's kind of an easy way to sort of think of that with military equipment is... If something comes along that can do exactly the same role better, then it replaces it. If it can fill the same role, but lacks in all of the other qualities of that thing, then it either doesn't replace it, but maybe it comes in to help, you know, bolster that role, or you got to go back to the drawing board on things like that. So, you know, kind of now sort of, you know, we'll talk a little bit more specifically about, you know, when we look at the Russian operations in Ukraine and some of the main failings, I think the biggest failing that you see, you know, right away is that one, and obviously you have to be very careful when you judge the videos coming out, because obviously the Ukrainians are going to post videos that, you know, show the Russians in a bad light and show themselves in a good light. The Russians are going to do the same thing in reverse. So, that, I mean, that's just, you know, that's just warfare 101 there. But, you know, if we look at the videos, so there's a lot of things that tend to kind of stand out. So one, you tend to see a lot of videos of lone Russian vehicles. Uh, being targeted, and uh, or at least relatively lone vehicles. So it might be, I mean, it might be with its parent unit, but, you know, um, you know, a few hundred meters away from, you know, its supporting vehicles, its supporting elements, its supporting infantry. You tend to see them almost entirely without recognizable infantry support. Um, that's a very common one. And tons and tons of drone footage. And so, one... Obviously, like when it comes to strictly spotting observation, drones can get awfully small. So it's it is a, a pretty big ask at this point to be like, oh hey, you have to clear the battle space of all drones. But almost invariably, you see that one, the vehicles are by themselves and or without recognizable infantry support, and or very exposed to some form of air asset, whether it's a drone that's just observing them, whether they're being attacked by a drone. Uh, there's obviously lots of footage of the, the Bayraktar TB2 drones doing a lot of work there and things like that. Um, and then, you know, there are a lot of other videos of kind of classical ambushes on like armored columns and things like that, um, which I think is, you know, kind of, you know, kind of standard. And that's where one, the, the man portable anti-tank weapons, you know, they definitely, they definitely are hard to detect, you know, in the strictly, especially the urban ambush kind of standpoint. Um, never mind that thunder in the background there, but, uh, 
you know, that's where then again, the supporting arms come in. So supporting arms can be artillery in the terms of, you know, the Russians also like their MLRSs, their multiple launch rocket systems, their GROD systems, they call them. Um, and then as well as obviously the, the prosecuting air assets, whether you're talking rotary wing with their, uh, you know, MI8s and, and MI24s and then their KA-52s or whether you're talking fixed wings, uh, you know, they still have the, the Sukhoi 25, the, the frog foot and they have the SU-35 and things like that. So you pretty much invariably see them violating one or pretty much all tenets of that combined arms doctrine that we kind of talked about before. Now, again, obviously, like urban operations really stress the uh, the capabilities of the tank or the armored vehicle in general, just because of the nature of like, I mean, and, and this is something I'm, I'm very personally familiar with, you know, you know, from my time, uh, you know, during the second battle of Fallujah there in late 2004 and early 2005, which is that. Man, it's weird. Like, you never think of it till you're there, but, like, when you walk around cities, it's like, there's an awful lot of freaking places for people to hide, you know? And it's it's borderline impossible to detect them. You know, there's trees, there's bushes, there's rubble, there's, there's like, sheets hanging on freaking clotheslines, you know? And, like, I, I can still remember the first time that uh, we got in, like, a really big engagement, not to get off track, you know, kind of early in the morning on November 9th, 2004. And, uh, and I was looking at this building... And I was, and we were, there's just tons of dudes in there. And so I was lighting it up with a Mark 19. And this is all, this is actually on, on video, like one of the kind of the, the like professional photographers we had around us, like got it. And off to my right, only like 10 feet away, there's this wall and there's like this sheet or this, I don't know what you call it, like a banner kind of hanging over it. And I'm so fixated on this building and like doing all sorts of stuff. And then, it, you know, there's kind of like a little like lull for, I don't know, like, like 10 seconds or whatever. And, and so it's kind of one of those, I can like, you know, I feel my, I can hear my own heartbeat, like inside of my armor. And I just see this, like, flash of white, like, out of the corner of my eye just, like, run past me. So my brain was like, oh, shit. Obviously, that's a dude in a white man dress, and he's rolling right up on you. You better turn over there and smoke him. So I basically turn over there to, like, grab my rifle and look over there, and it's just a banner blowing in the wind. It's obviously, it's absolutely nothing. It's like guys who deer, you know, who hunt deer. It's just what freaking squirrels do to you. You know, you're sitting in your, sitting in your tree stand, and you hear this crunch, 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 and it's the loudest thing you ever heard in your whole life, and you look back over there, and it's a freaking squirrel, you know. So, uh, like, urban environments are just, <laughs> just, they provide all sorts of problems um, when it comes to those things. So to kind of, you know, so what the Russians appear to not be doing well at all, and what they should be doing and like I said, again, we have to keep a little bit of a grain of salt with this is that like urban operations, they stress absolutely everything to the max, but particularly armored vehicles. But so they should have air assets that are up. So one prosecuting the enemy, driving away known enemy, like especially like armored units, you know, if there's if there's tanks or if there's artillery and and things like the, the very obvious threat should be driving them away. And then obviously sending back, you know, real time or relatively real time, you know, information, intelligence and things like that. You should have infantry units that are, you know, even with or out in front of your armored elements, clearing known or presumed enemy positions, especially of anti-tank weapons and or like indirect fire positions. So obviously tanks are very good when they can have long areas of observation and fire um, and their flanks can be protected by infantry and other tanks and terrain and things like that. So, so what the infantry should be doing is the infantry should be they should be taking areas of like, you know, high ground or observation. They should be clearing out, you know, presumed pockets and things like that. And then the tanks can move up into good firing positions. They can work over the buildings. They can do this or that. And then, okay, now the infantry should be then moving into the building that the tanks just worked over that has good observation. Once they work in there, then the, the infantry should be clearing out areas, calling an indirect fire, prosecuting these areas themselves, whether with, you know, snipers, whether with, you know, their own indirect weapons, you know, hand grenades, things like that. And then moving their tanks kind of into the next position where they can assist each other. And it should be going like this. And then obviously, while this is going on, you should have indirect fire and you should have your air assets and things that are prosecuting the enemies that are further in front of you than you can, um, than you can kind of deal with it at the time. Because obviously the enemy is going to be resupplying or they're going to be trying to maneuver and get into better positions or fall back out of, you know, compromised positions themselves. And so then these should be prosecuted as you're moving up. And that's kind of the, the low and slow you know, way to do it. The absolute worst thing to do is to basically try to move tanks up on small roads or, you know, in between buildings and things prior to them being properly cleared and without having indirect fire and close in infantry support to deal with 
these small man portable anti-tank teams that are out there. Because like I said, it's one of the very interesting things about the modern realm, which is that now a dude can carry on his shoulder, you know, a fire and forget weapon that can, you know, take out most armored vehicles. Um, I mean, obviously an end law, it's man portable. So is a javelin. I mean, javelin's still really freaking heavy. You know, it weighs like 70 pounds when you include all this stuff together. So it's, it's man portable, but it's not like, you know, this isn't, you know, Baghdad 2008. Hey, let me peek around the corner and just fire a shot blindly around. That's not how those things work. Um, but, uh, you know, but they're all, are all sorts of weapons that can still prosecute armor, um, you know, in that way. And those are very difficult to deal with, but these are also, conversely, this is also the role that tanks fill for infantry. So main battle tanks, their frontal armor is extremely resistant to all but the absolute best uh, man-portable anti-tank weapons out there. That's why weapons like, you know, the Javelin, the Enlaw, and, um, and, uh, and some other weapons, they tend to, you know, they have a top-down attack capability. But again, those are relatively difficult to use in urban environment because you have to have a clear line of sight. The Javelin, for example, you know, you have the clue, the command launch unit. So it basically kind of has this little box that you work in with a couple of joysticks, put it around the tank. It basically kind of like takes a picture of it, you know, for lack of a better word, remembers it, goes out, flies up. Basically, it finds that picture again, comes down on top of it. But obviously, you can't do that particularly well in a very, you know, confined space. Uh, it, it's difficult to difficult to use like that. So the tank's frontal armor in this case provides the protection for the infantry and makes it difficult for these, uh, you know, anti-tank teams that are using the relatively ineffective anti-armor weapons, say the RPG-7, their various, um, you know, kind of copies of the law, you know, the RPG, uh, RPG like 18 and 22 and things like that, um, protects them from that stuff. And then the tank provides the kind of suppressing fire and fire support that keeps those guys from being able to step out onto the, the bigger roads and deal with the tanks. And then the infantry, conversely, the infantry goes into the buildings and they do the nasty stuff up close and they, they call for fire and things like that. So, you know, those are the big, the big failings. And then the other thing that's really nasty about urban environment is that um, you tend to do a lot of like take and retreat sort of operations because it's basically impossible to have, you know, an entire, um, you know, group of military units lined up online. And then you're like, all right, we're going to advance in the city and we're going to all stay online. Well, obviously immediately one group is going to be faster than the other one because either they have better roads or better terrain, or they're just not meeting much resistance or whatever. And you're going to have groups who are the opposite. They're going to be slowed down immediately. And so one thing that I kind of learned, you know, from my time, um, you know, in Fallujah is that like, you kind of think, okay, hey, you know, once we start a line, we're basically just going to move in a straight line and clear this until we hit the end of the city. But that wasn't how it worked for us at all. Like we would, you know, we would clear during the day and do things like that. And then at night, they would usually kind of find some place for us to hole up. And usually we'd try to find like some sort of building or small complex where you could fit like the whole company into like one defensive perimeter. One, because they wanted our air assets to be able to prosecute things at night with lower chance of friendly uh, you know, friendly fire. So IE, they don't want us out in five different perimeters. If we could be in one, it's easier to kind of control from a safety standpoint. Um, you know, but then obviously they're also doing observation and getting intel and stuff. And so like, Hey, you know, as we were clearing here, you know, in the middle of the night, the guys were kind of shifting around and now it looks like the enemy concentration is a little bit further to the West. So, you know, then in the morning we'd wake up and, you know, we'd get in the vehicles and we'd drive two blocks West and reset up and we'd go through the, you know, and it was, it was kind of a lot of that stuff. It was not at all just like a, Hey, you're just going to walk from here walk from the north to the south, clear everything in front of you as you go. That's not really how it worked. And that's kind of the same thing you see now. And so, you know, you have to keep that in mind, which is, you know, because then you kind of have to, you have to fall back and reposition and stuff like that, which means that the enemy tends to, you know, infiltrate, you know, back into, um, back into those positions. And so you kind of have to take them over again and, and, and things like that. And so then we kind of, you know, obviously that's talking about the urban environment. Then we talk about the you know, kind of just out in the countryside. So obviously, so Ukraine's a, a country that's primarily, you know, a, like step environment, i.e. flat. I mean, they have lots of woods and forests and things, but there's not a lot of like particularly massive terrain features out there. So that's prime country for the various, um, you know, radio and wire guided um, anti-tank missiles that you see, you know, the, you know, analogous to the toe. You have like the Stugna and you have the Russian Cornet. And then obviously you have the Javelin, the Enlaw. And, uh, and things like that. And you have the Swedish slash German Panzerfaust III. And, um, 
and other other comparable weapons. And that's where like the javelin is in his element in places like that. So that is uh, it is obviously difficult to deal with. But again, this is where this is where the coordination and what it looks to be like the training level of the Russian infantry is incredibly low. And this is I've you know obviously I'd heard this or read this before, and, and I don't want to be too dramatic, but kind of the operations in the Ukraine have kind of made me think that all of the criticisms that the uh, the various German generals and field marshals and things at the end of World War II said about the Russians were true, even if there were other things that they were basically able to compensate with. And so when you read like von Manstein, for example, um, you know, or you read, um, you know, Heinz Guderian and you, and you read other guys like that is, is they, they, they constantly talked about how the, the Russians were very good at the operational level, but at the tactical level, their infantry didn't really know how to do anything but do a big artillery barrage and then a frontal assault, sometimes backed by armor, sometimes not backed by armor. And it kind of sounds like an oversimplification, you know, and it also kind of sounds like it's a little bit of like guys kind of bleeding, like, oh, they only beat us because of this or that. But then when you actually think about it, it seems to be like very true. So you can have infantry that are very untrained as far as running like very detailed company and battalion regimental level operations but operation they can be very sound they have their tanks and their artillery in the right places they occupy the right terrain and they stress the lines in the right places so yes they take a lot more casualties and they kind of do it the really ugly way but if they still manage to penetrate the defensive line the defensive system it kind of doesn't matter and that seems to be very very accurate for for what they're doing and it seems to be you know kind of very accurate for what's going on right now um you know, somebody said, or maybe I read it online, I can't remember, like somebody said the other day, it was like, you know, Russia's always been, you know, a nuclear power with a third world army. Uh, and you're like, you know, and now it kind of seems more and more accurate on that because, you know, it looks like very low levels of, of you know, at the at the low level, it looks like just really poor, you know, planning and, and implementation of, of doctrine and things like that, you know, just because, this is where the personal level of discipline, and, and it's it's kind of the, uh, it's what I find to be the most interesting conundrum of, like, leadership, or especially, like, military leadership, which is that, like, when you're talking about, like, an entire battle, or an entire campaign, or an entire war, and you're like, hey, does one person matter? It, nope, they do not. Nobody gives a flying shit about one idiot private when you're talking about a 100,000-man operation. However, when you're doing an operation, does one man matter? If that guy is the person who operates the radio or has to put his tank in the correct place or he sees an enemy and he just turns around and properly reports that he saw this particular enemy and this particular equipment in this place. Yes, he absolutely does matter. So that's kind of the it's kind of the conundrum on there, which is like, no, you don't matter. You're just a cog in a humongous wheel, but also you definitely matter when you don't do the thing that you are needed to do. So it's um, for me, that's an interesting kind of thing. And so, you know, this is, um, I had this conversation with a friend of mine, that's probably been a month or two ago now, but I kind of, um, I kind of mentioned that the thing that the Ukraine needs to be careful about is because obviously, you know, lots of videos and, you know, Russia's prestige has taken a massive hit on this, but, you know, obviously they started out the invasion with like five axes of advance. You're up by Kiev. You're over by Chernyiv and Sumy, you have Kharkov, you have Donetsk, Luhansk, you have, you know, Crimea. And so they need to be very careful um, that they, or what they need to do is they need to use all of these victories and all of this Russian, um, you know, you know, tomfoolery stuff to try to implement, to try to instigate some level of political change in Russia. And I've been a big advocate of cross-border raids, um, you know, whether attacking logistics, whether attacking civilians and things like that, I think that would be, you know, exactly the kinds of things that one could and should do if you're trying to, you know, get a population that has significant elements that are against the war to be more against the war. But then, you know, kind of my, my reasoning, my premise behind that was that if the, if the Ukrainians don't capitalize politically, i.e. strategically, on Russia's failings and their successes... Russia is going to have enough time to learn what to do or what they're doing really poorly. And they're going to have enough time to fix it. I'm not saying they're going to become like all of a sudden, like just masters of everything, but like they're going to have enough time to fix the most egregious of their mistakes. 
And it kind of appears that we've entered that phase a little bit. So obviously the Russians pulled out of the, the northern parts around Kiev and Chernyev and Sumy, repositioned, put more elements around Kharkov, which I was kind of, you know, if I was the Russians, this was what I was calling for them to do earlier, was to try to slice through Kharkov and be able to cut off the entirety of the eastern half of Ukraine there. Um, you know, especially in, you know, in, in pinning, pinning anyone else who gets trapped there between them and the, uh, the Dnieper River. And then it also appears that they've gotten, you know, a little bit smarter with, you know, a little bit of their coordination of, of elements and things like that. Now, I don't think they're by any stretch, like have fixed all their problems. There's been, there's been rumors or things I've heard of supposedly they've been using some, uh, some Chechens as barrier troops or otherwise having to basically you know, have police units keep their own men from mutinying or, you know, retreating and things like that, uh, which I guess is a little bit of a, a throwback to the, uh, the old NKVD blocking position tactic of, uh, of especially the early part of World War II. And so, you know, I think, and in that way, and this is like, I, I, I posted this on my Facebook like a while back, which is, you know, I kind of compared this exactly to the winter war, you know, in Finland in 1939-40. And I think you kind of see that because there's a lot of similarities in that, the Russians went into, the Soviets went into Finland, you know, like the end of November 1939. Okay, great choice, guys. And um, and basically just made complete fools of themselves. And the Finns had absolutely no capacity to full-on beat the Soviets. Nobody thought that. But they really made them look stupid for a while with their, their ambush tactics, you know, their hit-and-run tactics, you know, kind of their famous, you know, like troops on skis and, and things like that. You know, but also Finnish terrain is just awful. Like, tons of woods, very few roads, lots of, like, small lakes everywhere. It's like northern European Minnesota, basically. And But the Russians eventually kind of, you know, fixed things. Instead of trying to go up, you know, way into the, uh, the north and the northeastern parts of Finland, they really focused where they could use armor around the Karelian Isthmus, you know, pushed across there. And became, you know, and eventually did win. I think, I think the war ended in, like, March. So you're talking three, four months. Um, you know, we're kind of at the... You know, we're kind of in the, uh, you know, the three, four month phase coming up here. So we'll kind of see, you know, how time will tell on that. Um, but as far as, you know, primary things I wanted to talk about tonight, that pretty much, you know, covers it all. So to kind of, you know, recap a little bit. So is the tank or is the armored vehicle dead? No, but you're starting to see why doctrine and why combined arms operations are even more important, i.e. you have to have... You have a team, right? So this is a basketball team. Like you have to have guys doing all of their roles. You cannot just send tanks out by themselves. They're too vulnerable, especially in the era where the six inch fricking drone is available, you know, at, at fricking Best Buy or whatever, you know, to anybody out there. So they're going to get observed. So you have to have air assets out prosecuting, you know, large enemy formations or known anti-tank or artillery positions. You have to have Infantry taking over key terrain, um, otherwise, you know, like driving back enemy patrols and, and rooting out some of these, you know, kind of individual anti-tank teams. You need to have artillery, your indirect fire, your mortars, your garage systems, softening up obvious presumed targets, you know, large areas of observation, like big buildings, uh, you know, known trench systems and fighting positions, things like that. And then obviously you have to have your armor moving up. And, uh, and operating in a way in which they are supporting each other, not allowing themselves to be, you know, separated, sectioned off, where they can be assaulted from multiple directions, um, you know, but and then in a position where they're supporting the infantry that is protecting them, uh, you know, so kind of classic combined arms doctrine on that. But that's pretty much all I've got for the night, guys. But remember, only the hits count, and you can never miss fast enough to catch back up.